The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. The summer before last summer, I would go out there every single day at the beach and just lay out day, day after day. Actually, it was probably every summer since I was 11. Every summer since 11. The sun, the surf, the sand. A lot of teens love to get out in the sun. They may think that a tan looks healthy, but the reality is too much sun is dangerous skin cancer, sun damage. And that maybe in the future, your skin will get all wrinkly. But certainly we're seeing adolescents doing more sunbathing, more tanning. As bad as too much sun can be for your skin, tanning beds can be even worse. This is the spectrum of light, which is dangerous in suntan booths. Those energy values are 10 to 15 times higher than the noonday sun. A lot of my friends go, and I always yell at them, and I tell them that it's not good for you, and they're going to get cancer. Most teens don't really worry about sunburn. They're just really concerned about how their tan looks. And that casual attitude is becoming an increasing health risk. Skin cancer is really becoming an epidemic these days. The data is showing an increased number of all cases of melanoma in the United States. Uh, in 1973, the number was approximately six to seven per 100,000. And in 1997, the number was up to 22 per 100,000. So there's almost been a tripling of the incidence of melanoma in that time. That's one word that everybody dreads to hear is cancer and that you have it. But will most teens really listen to the warnings? You know, there are only a few guarantees in life, and I'm going to give you one of them. Those uh, tanning booths are going to damage and hurt you, usually earlier in your lifetime than you want. You get severe wrinkling very early. I see um, girls in their 20s who look like they're 40 now. Sometimes the, the teenagers will respond more to the fact that they're going to look terrible at age 25. Still, it's difficult to get teens to think about long-term health risks. The teenage years are, are, are difficult because it is so popular to have a tan and um, there's a lot of peer pressure. During the teenage years we think that nothing can ever harm us. So it's very difficult to try to convince them that it is important for some protection. You're hearing. What kinds of behaviors put it at risk? When William and his buddies load into a truck, they don't want to ride. They just want to cruise and listen to music. Probably about 1,000 going to the subs and 300 going to the highs. Meanwhile, Brittany and her friend Sarah are getting an earful at a rock concert. No, I don't worry about my hearing. No, I don't really ever think of the risks. But there are risks. And unfortunately, we don't feel the damage as it happens. It's damage that builds up and builds up and over time can permanently damage the hearing that we have. And a study by the CDC says 13% of children and teens ages 6 to 19 suffer from some degree of noise-induced hearing loss. Well, what typically happens for an ear that is exposed to loud noises, particularly on a repetitive basis, is that you have cumulative damage to the main sensory cells within your ear to the point where you lose, particularly in the higher tones, uh, a little bit along the way until you, uh, when tested 10, 15 years later, you notice that you have noticeable deficits in your ability to understand certain things. And some teens already are feeling the damage. I can't hear so well out on my left side. I seem to have already lost a little bit of mine. Over the two years I've listened to my stereo system. Back at the rock concert, the girls admit they're among the vast majority of teens who don't use ear protection. Why not? Brittany says peer pressure is part of the reason. Just because nobody else does and I don't want to be the only one. It's not cool. 
It's not, really. Because everybody else will be like, looking at you. But the girls admitted the concert noise affected their hearing. We walked out during the little halftime, and it was kind of, it was different. I could hear everything, but it was a little foggy kind of hearing, like if your ears were popped. It was really hard to hear. Like, you could hear everything, but it was really, really soft. Ultimately, doctors say teens need to be aware of the risk of long-term damage. It actually is what happens during childhood and early adulthood, which sets you on the path towards early hearing loss versus maintaining good hearing throughout much of your adult life. Being aware of that is crucial. So protecting your ears early and often is really your best uh, course of action in terms of protecting your hearing. And he says there's a way for teens to protect their ears and still be cool. There are a number of different colors and consistencies to the devices, and I'm sure that if most children were able to see the full range of products that were available, they would find something that would fit their needs. Sleep or lack of sleep, how can it affect your health? These days, teens are getting less and less sleep, and it's starting to take a toll on some of them. It's 6.54 a.m., and less than seven hours after going to bed, Sarah's up again, getting ready for another hectic day. Sarah's a competitive swimmer and often practices before school. I like to get about 10 hours of sleep a night. That'd be good. But how much does she actually get? Six, maybe. D it kind of depends on if I have some practice in the morning or how late I was studying the night before, but I usually I guess about six. It's a very common problem. Teenagers tend to require more sleep, maybe nine, ten hours on the average. What are some of the problems associated with too little sleep? Change in performance in terms of grades. Um, socially, are they becoming uh, more antisocial or, or irritable, difficult to deal with. Those would be some things in the daytime or just the fact that they're tired and they're nodding off. I'm incredibly grouchy and I just, I just feel awful. Like, there, I don't think there's any point in like falling asleep in school all day and like going to swim practice and not getting anything out of it if you feel awful. But Sarah's busy life isn't going to change anytime soon. Because I have to finish schoolwork and I have to go to swim practice. Like I, you can't, you can't pull off schoolwork at the school I go to. It's, especially now, I have a year more. I have a year before. Like I go to, I go off to college, so I need to, I need to keep up my work. So how can overtaxed teens get more sleep? You'd probably want to uh, first try to organize uh, the sleep time and get rid of uh, behaviors at night uh, that that allow you to maintain wakefulness. Things like television, radios. Um, activities on computers and games that maintain alertness and awareness. Those are things you want to get out of the bedtime, uh, around an hour before bedtime. Sarah understands that, but she also knows there are times when she has to allow her body to catch up. I can go to bed as early as possible when I, when I get to feel like that, or, I, or take a day off, which is not usually wanted, but I take it off of swimming and take a nap. And she keeps her busy life in perspective. If I decided that like I wasn't, I was going to stop going to morning practice and stop getting up early, then there'd be no point in swimming. Because like if you do something, you have to do it all the way. You can't just do it halfway. Your teeth. Of course, brushing and flossing are important. But what other behaviors can affect your dental health? Brushing and flossing regularly greatly reduces the chance of cavities and gum disease. But it doesn't eliminate the risk. And that risk? can come from unexpected sources. Take sports drinks. They're very popular these days, but they can pose an unintended health hazard. In fact, research in a dentistry journal shows they may be far worse for your teeth than even sugary sodas. Why? They're loaded with carbohydrates and they're loaded with acids. And to the surprise of everybody, the acids are actually a, a big part at causing enamel erosion. The acid strips calcium from the enamel of the teeth. So it pretty much washes away your enamel. And you only have two millimeters of enamel normally. So you're not allowed to lose much of it. She says if you decide to drink sports drinks, use a straw. If you drink it through a straw, it just goes to the back and the only teeth that may be affected will be your back teeth. And always drink water afterwards. Her other advice to teens? Moderation is the key, but if you use proper oral hygiene and, and you use it sparingly, you, you'll be okay. Your skin. Aside from avoiding the sun, 
what other decisions can affect your health. Skate uh, sparkles party. You had some cool friends. Rachel says she made a big mistake when she was 16. She wanted a tattoo, even though she knew she couldn't get one legally from a licensed tattoo artist. You have to be 18 to go get you know, professionally done, so I got a homemade tattoo. So there was bleeding and um, the ink didn't go directly into my skin. We had to go over it many times. Even with those problems, she thought it was no big deal. Her parents were against it, but she didn't let that stop her. The main reason I got a tattoo was trying to be cool. I always wanted to be older and do what the older people did. But that feeling didn't last. The day after I got my tattoo, I did not like it. I realized I made a mistake. Rachel regrets her decision to get a tattoo tremendously. I'm embarrassed by my tattoo, basically. It's a sign of um, stupidity in my youth. Now, she's going through the painstaking and expensive process of tattoo removal. It's $100 a treatment. And she's gone nine times in a year. That's $900 and counting. I know several people that have some tattoos and that would love to get them removed. Homemade tattoos on their hands, on their arms. They would love to have the opportunity that I have to get it removed. Rachel's experience shows that deciding to get a tattoo is a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your life. Because the only way to remove a tattoo One, two, three. is to go through the pain and expense Rachel is going through. It's been really awful. It's been painful, and it's taken a long time. Rachel even asked her younger sister to come along with her to watch the latest laser removal. Because, you know, um, I didn't want her to make the same mistakes as I have. And to um, just see that tattoos are permanent. I mean, there's surgery today, but they'll even tell you that it will not come off completely. You can have it faded. You can... Um, you know, do whatever, but it's never going to come off completely. Masha used to lie out in the sun and use tanning beds. She never worried about what that repeated exposure might do to her, until one day. When I found out that my dad had cancer, it made a huge impact on me whether or not to tan or not in the sun. Family history is a risk factor for many types of cancer, including skin cancer. Masha realized that what happened to her dad could one day happen to her, and she decided it wasn't worth the risk to keep tanning. It just made me realize that it was pointless, you know. Ryan knows that now, too. When he was 13, he noticed a strange mole on his scalp. Just started growing and changing color, so mom took me to the hospital to get it, like, taken off. In Ryan's case, melanoma didn't take years to develop. It happened when he was 13. Melanoma can be deadly when it spreads, first to the lymph nodes, then to organs like the lungs and the brain. At the point that melanoma begins to spread, it becomes a very difficult disease to treat. For Ryan, the disease did spread to his lymph nodes. It was hard because, I mean, you had to get shots and stuff and like go on. And sometimes it's really bad because after, this, um, after the surgery, you'll think that that's the way your face is going to look like forever and then you're just going to be sad. That's how I was when my face first got like all cut up and I thought that's the way I was going to look for the rest of my life. Ryan had several risk factors. For one, he never wore sunscreen, and Ryan's genetics also played a role. He is very fair. He's very blonde. He has very fair skin. He always burnt. I mean, I did want him to wear sunscreen. A lot of times he forgot. I wish I would have put sunscreen every time on, like every time I went to the beach or the pool or like when I was out like for a long period of time. Everyone thinks it's not going to happen to you. you. You don't think, you know, something simple as playing outside and ha kids having fun that there could be consequences behind it. After surgery to remove cancerous lymph nodes and chemotherapy, Ryan's been declared cancer-free, but he still must take shots of the anti-cancer drug interferon, 
and his doctor says Ryan will always need to avoid the sun. So he is someone that we are going to have to watch long term for recurrence of the melanoma. And, and melanoma is not something that just comes back within five years. Melanoma has recurred at 20 years out. So it's something that he's going to have to watch for for the rest of his life. Now, Ryan has a warning for teens who aren't worried about the damaging effects of the sun. All those kids out there that don't want to wear sunscreen, better think twice because it's not a cool thing to have. It's really painful. For most people, the teen years are some of the healthiest. The frequent colds and other illnesses of childhood are gone. And the problems of aging are still years away. So, most teens don't give much thought to health care. They don't even go to the doctor very often. Well, it's been at least a year, at least. I don't get very sick that often. I go when I have something wrong with me. <laughs> I don't like cold stethoscopes, and I don't like, um, just having to be checked out. I don't like the smell. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor. <laughs> but want to or not, everyone needs to see a doctor periodically. You need their advice, answers to your questions, and reassurance about all the changes going on in your life. We have a place where you can come and you can talk to folks when your parents are bugging you, when your friends are giving you trouble. Um, if you want somebody to talk to, here we are. A lot of teenagers don't know, um, you know, whether they're the right weight or height, whether they're properly sexually developed, um, what's happening in each, you know, as they get older. They don't, haven't understood what their bodies are doing. And my purpose here is to answer all your questions. To sing and it just hurts to, you know, take a deep breath. Fifteen-year-old Christina goes to the doctor for regular checkups. But, unlike in the past, she now sees the doctor alone. And she says it makes a huge difference. Just to talk about things that, you know, the things that you just don't want to say to your mom out loud. And doctors can help explain that to your parents. When I tell them about confidentiality, I said I would like the chance to talk to Johnny alone because there's some things that they share with another adult, particularly a doctor who's in charge of their health care, that they may not feel comfortable in sharing with you. Like puberty, sex, and STIs, doctors understand your concerns and are bound by a certain level of confidentiality. Up to, but not including, serious chance of death. If the child's going to commit suicide or going to kill her mother, I am probably you know, going to say, well, let's talk to your mom about that one. If that child is doing drugs, is sexually active, that's covered by the deal. Confidentiality so sure the teenager that in some areas that are not dangerous or not threatening to his life, he can have that secret between us. I think that's part of his adulthood, you know, that he should learn that there are areas that he can ask information with a health professional that will just be handled like an adult. And knowing that she can talk openly to her doctor has helped Christina be honest and feel comfortable with difficult topics she doesn't want to talk about with her mom. It's nice to know that I have the option of not telling her and telling a doctor and knowing that there will be somebody there to listen to me. Some parents may not like being left out of the loop, but Christina says her mom eventually understood why it's important. I think initially she was a little, you know, well, why couldn't you tell me? But, you know, I think as she thought about it a little bit more, I think it made sense to her. And the way I explain that to parents, uh, if your child needs medical assistance, they're going to get it better from me than uh, if I know what's going on, than if nobody knows what's going on. But to know what's really going on, teens have to tell the truth. A study by the American Medical Association shows almost half of teens lie to their doctors about risky behaviors like sexual activity and drug use because they're afraid the doctor will tell their parents. But Dr. Wagner says that when a doctor promises confidentiality, you'll get it. These kids are not going to show up to the doctor if they think it's going to get back to their parents. And in return, I'll ask them to be honest. So the trade is honesty for confidentiality. And if your goal is to get straight answers, you've got to be responsible enough to explain your situation honestly and completely so that your doctor understands and can give you the best possible information.
You have to realize that it's their job and it's their profession. They do this every day with hundreds of kids. I mean, they're not, they're not there to like make fun of you or ridicule you. They're just there to help. That's what they're getting paid for. So when you go to the doctor and you have questions, check it out. Ask. That's why they're there. And believe it or not, most doctors are pretty, pretty cool. They're not going to run back and say, guess what she said or he said. Ask the question. And that's a very good source of information. Even though doctors are available and willing to talk, even though they promise confidentiality, the awkwardness or embarrassment may still be too much for some teens. So, they look elsewhere for information. I think what, where kids tend to go, they go to other friends, they go to their peers first. Then they tend to go to young adults, you know, someone, cousins, uh, they go to friends, family friends that are they think that are cool, you know, that they think they can talk to. I think a lot of times um, people just pick it up at school. I don't, yeah. You know, yeah. you don't necessarily know where it comes from, but the information is out there, either, either from comes, like, you know. yeah, either from an older brother or sister. Then it's, through that, then there's also a lot of misinformation exactly. and a lot and of wives' yeah. tales and just kind of crazy stuff that you hear that you assume is true because it's coming yeah. from <laughs> Susie in the locker room and she's cool, you know, but I think um, the best information is from an informed source. I think the most important thing is to always have a discussion with your parents or some other close family member if it's not your parents so they can help you through the process. And that means helping you sort through all the information that's out there, whether it's from the locker room, health class, or on the internet. The internet has millions of sites that look professional and official and teens are checking them out for answers to health questions. I look on the internet like when I want to find symptoms for something. If it was a personal problem that I didn't feel like comfortable talking to anybody about, I would probably just look it up online. The internet can provide teens with useful information about health issues, but it can also give them misinformation. Whether it's information about a drug or something that um, you eat or take, whether it's just anything has to be double checked because just because it's on a website does not mean it's true. So how can you tell the difference between reliable sites and sites with misinformation? Make sure you know who's putting that information on a website. Usually the really good internet sites will let you know who's writing the stuff. They'll even give you a little blurb about who's doing it. Um, make sure it's someone you could trust. Go to medical base or psychological based sites where the information has been reviewed and is real good. And sometimes the web address itself can be a good indicator. Dot coms and dot nets are commercial sites, which may exist just to make money. Dot edus are educational sites run by colleges and universities. Dot govs are government sites, like the CDC site. .org sites are run mostly by nonprofit organizations. No matter what, for medical advice... Be careful when you're looking on the internet, as it, whether it's a .edu, .org, I mean, it all depends on who's actually making that web page and posting it, and that could be anybody. These teens do use the internet to look up health information, but they do it carefully and critically. Every once in a while I will look up medical advice on the internet, yeah. Uh, basically search and then um, to find out any common websites that had the most hits for it and yeah, check those. I usually go straight to medical sites that I know I can trust. I don't think I can really trust the internet or anything. I don't really like put it as my main I don't, information source. I can trust it if it's like from certain medical sites and stuff like that, but if it was just like randomly on the internet, I probably wouldn't trust it that much. It's a lot of things out there and it There's so much health information out there. Teens can even find online mental health sites that seem like a substitute for seeing a therapist in person. These sites can be appealing because talking about problems face to face with a stranger isn't easy. It would be awkward because you don't know them and like you're spilling your guts to them and you don't know you could trust them or not. A little intimidating probably, yeah, could be. Mostly of the way they would act towards us, would they respect us, what do they think of us? That sort of nervousness is one of the reasons online therapists are popping up all over the internet. 
and some teens are using them instead of making an appointment with someone in person. 17-year-old Christina is an online patient hundreds of miles away from her therapist. She writes, There are things that I was feeling that I'd be too afraid to say out loud to someone. Typing seems much easier, and I believe it's a big help. Christina says her experience was good, but professionals warn that it can be dangerous to share personal information online. Who knows who's hiding behind an email? The, the problems with um, security, you know, do you really want your mental health history out there on the web? And she says there's no substitute for a face-to-face -face interaction. The reasons we want to do the face-to-face -face is it's a human connection. I get to look at your face, your facial expressions, your body language, and that's a, a big piece that can't be done in an email. It just can't. Basically, I think they could help me better if they could see what I'm like and my personality, because when you're just typing text back and forth, they don't really get to know you very well. Even though online therapy is risky, you can still find tools on the internet to help you, if you know where to look. If you're looking online, you know, uh, go to uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, those kinds of, of sites that are legitimate, and if, you know, take the checklist there. But that's just the first part. If it looks as though you meet some of the criteria, yes, I do have this symptom, yes, that's true of me, yes. And check it out with your parents, too. Have them do this with you and then take that information to a licensed mental health professional. I mean, I definitely trust the doctor more than a website because a doctor is gonna be able to do a more, much more in-depth analysis of your health or some type of illness that you have. Some doctors have found a valuable use of the internet that can help their patients heal. Some teens who have serious illnesses need more than treatments and medications. They need emotional support as well. <laughs> While doctors use the latest technology to cure disease and lessen pain, they're also using it to ease the feelings of isolation and fear that come with serious illnesses. Hi, I'm on treatment for kidney failure. These teens are linked together through a hospital network designed to put patients with similar medical conditions in contact so they can share their experiences. Because they may be thinking, well, none of my friends understand, but this new friend that I've made, who I've talked to through the, the computer, they can understand what my world is like. A world full of tests, treatments, surgeries, pain. But having someone who understands can make it a little easier to handle. Sometimes it might not be the same illness, but they're going through the same procedures, you know, how do you handle your um, dialysis or how do you handle your radiation treatment. No matter what they're going through, there's someone else who's been there before. Even outside of the hospital network, there are support groups and internet chat rooms run specifically to discuss problems that teens face. If you find a reputable site, the camaraderie and connection with other teens in your situation can make a big difference. And when they're talking to different kids, you know, it's just amazing to see when, when the other kid kind of opens up to um, share what they're going through, then it allows them to open up. Friends, parents, doctors, the internet, all can be valuable sources of information. But you have to learn to recognize that some are more trustworthy than others. I tell people when they're looking up information, don't just go to one source. Check it out with several sources. So if you read about it here and then you ask John in the locker room and John says something different, you say, hmm, these two, that doesn't match. Let me check it out with someone else. Or let me check it out with another source. Because ultimately, teens are getting to an age where they are responsible for their own health. Doctors say they can help teens make that transition. We're really focused on preventive medicine, and so our interest is keeping folks healthy. Um, and we're interested in growth and development, so the issues that happen for kids are things that we're concerned about. Pediatricians especially are prepared to deal with the problems and issues teenagers are facing every day. Sports issues, school issues, 
women's health issues, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, suicide, depression. I mean, all of those things that come up in an adolescent's life uh, are, are things that pediatricians are uh, sensitive to. But a lot of teens feel like they've outgrown the pediatrician. They often don't want to sit in a doctor's waiting office with a lot of little two-year-olds and crying babies. But there are options. So a lot of county facilities have teen clinics, and those are a lot of the time are being used by adolescents, particularly in late adolescence. Many hospitals have nurse advice lines nowadays. Um, our nurse advice line director um, tells us that they get a fair amount of calls from adolescents who just want to ask questions. And these numbers are advertised, they're in the phone book, they're advertised on television. So there are ways to get your questions answered accurately, to avoid unnecessary health risks and problems altogether. And it's up to you individually to make sure you are informed, to know as much as you can, and to get help when you need it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, first, when you get older, your parents aren't going to be there as much to make sure you're all right. And then, you know, you're going through physical changes and stuff like that. And then you also have all these social pressures like drugs and stuff. So you always have to be kind of cognizant of everything that's going around you and how it's going to affect you. What I tell teens is to understand this is your body. You are responsible and this is the only body you're going to get. You may do things on outside to change the way it looks, but guess what? This is it for you. So if you don't take care of it, no one else will. I think at this age we've started to notice that we have to take responsibility for our actions and that it's our body and we're the only ones that are going to be affected in the long run by our choices.